Behind me right now is my Mark 8 Golf R, which in the last few videos we have spent rebuilding, but I'm still yet to drive this car. But I'm sure that won't take too long because we've already done a lot of work on this crash damage golf file which I bought from an eBay listing, including fitting a new crash bar and rad pack and we even upgraded the intercooler while we were there, along with a new dashboard, airbag kit and complete front end. But in the last video we got it painted with only the front end left to assemble. But even when the front end's done, this project is not done to me because I have no intention of driving this as a standard car. But before we start with those modifications, we do need to get that front end back together so we pull the car back back into Tom's unit and get it on the ramp. So the first thing to go in is the headlights. So once those are pushed into place with the five bolts in them and plugged in, they're good to go. And now those headlights are on, we can move on to that first modification because we all know that I'm a bit of a sucker for a body kit, but I didn't want anything too out there and too outrageous for this Golf. So now it's time to fit the bumper and that brings us neatly on to the kit that Auto Ideas sent out. This is the first out of four pieces, a nice carbon fiber splitter just to accent the bottom beautifully. Now with this, we've just tech screwed it in place for now on the bumper so we make sure it's positioned perfectly, which we're gonna replace for nuts and bolts before we put it on the car. Because the splitter is most likely to take a heavy hit and also has a lot of air pushing against it, so we wanna make sure it's fastened tight. So now we've got that bolted on with some massive washers to help spread the load, we can fit the bumper back up to the car. And we can really get an idea of how that bumper is gonna look now, and it looks sensational. So we can get that fastened up and then move on to the grill. So with the three plugs on the back, the two for the light bar and one for the radar, this just then clips into place with two T20s, one in each corner. And then now it's time to see how that all looks. Moment of truth. Yeah. How much nicer is it to have that a kit that fits so properly? Intense. You know, so you have to spend weeks chopping a car up to, yeah. to get it on. That's nice, I like that split, that gives it that bit of mm. And now that we're happy with how that front end's looking, we can get the arch liners in. But before we can get that under tray bolted on, we've got a bit of clean up to do first because it looks like Mark McCann's been driving it. I'm presuming this is all part of the accident because it was all caked in into the subframe and other areas too. But that doesn't really add up to my original theory that this car went into the back of a lorry. But now we've got half of a field cleaned out of the subframe, we can get that under tray back into place and bolt that to the bumper and also the arch liners. And then it was time for the wheels to go on so we can finally take a look at how this car looks in its complete form. And how sick is that looking? What a great way to start this video. But we still have so much more to do. And on top of that, I've also got to start looking for a new car at some point soon because all of the projects are slowly coming to an end. So that means very soon we're going to have to say goodbye to the i30N and probably also the Jaguar F-Type SVR. So if you're interested in either of those cars, you know where to get at me. But like always, I've got my eyes peeled, ready and waiting for that next project to line up. Now I did find one potential project, which was a Toyota Yaris GR, but wait until you see the car vertical report on on this. So here we go. You can see that this car has a green tick, it's not our standard installed, it's got a green tick, it's not got any mileage fraud, but it has two amber warning lights, one for the financial and legal status, and one because it's got previous accident damage. But we'll come back to the accident damage in a second. You can see the mileage checks out on the odometer graph, and we can also see the full text and specs of the car too. We can see the car's full timeline from when it was manufactured up until today. So that includes ownership changes and when the car's been up for sale. But then at the bottom of that timeline, we can see that damage was detected and the car was marked as scrap. And as you can see in the damage report, the car was marked as a category B write-off, which means that this car can never ever go back on the road and it's only good for parts. And then the deeper we dive into the report, we can also see the photos of the damage. So you can see in 2021, the car was up for sale and looking immaculate. But in February 23, we can see photos from when it was at the salvage auction and also the damage that had been done. Although no airbags have been set off, we can see it's had a heavy front end collision and that's why 
Florida car is marked as a category B. That's why it can't go back on the road. And that's why unless you're breaking it for parts, this is a car you're gonna wanna avoid. Now, if that car had been repaired and you bought it, not doing a car vertical report, you could end up in a massive financial hole because it's solely your responsibility to check that. So to make sure that you don't get done over when you're buying a car, make sure to use Car Vertical and use my discount code Chris to save yourself some money off your report. So thank you Car Vertical for sponsoring this video, but now let's go and get back on with the Golf. But to do that, we've got the car back in the garage at home and as you can see, the splitter and the front end are on and complete and painted, but we're missing a few little bits. Like some of you have picked up in the last video, we're missing the R badge here, but also as well, the Golf R in my opinion, looks like it's just generally missing bits anyway. It looks really plain, a little bit boring if I'm being honest. I know it's supposed to be a sleeper, but it doesn't look anywhere near as aggressive as I think it should. So to carry on with the rest of the body kit, we get the car jacked up in the air and held up on axle stands too, because the sides and the rear of the car could really use something to spice them up. But luckily, the splitter is not the only thing that the guys at Auto ID have sent out to me. We've got some more carbon fiber. Oh. So to try and improve the look of the sides of the car, we've got new carbon fiber side skirt extensions to go on there as well. So to install these, what I did is put a little bit of double sided tape on the car to hold the carbon fiber side skirt in place and also some masking tape as well. And once I was happy with the position of the side skirt on the car, I then used tech screws to cement it in place. And once I've got all eight of these in place down the sides of the side skirt, it was then holding nice and sturdy so I can get the masking tape off, get the last two in, get it back on the floor and get on with the other side. But instantly, how much better does that look? It's like it was made to have this from the factory. But now that side's done, it's onto the other side and we can do exactly the same again. But some of you may have realized at this point, but I hadn't realized at the time at this little puddle underneath the car, but we'll have to come back to that a little bit later in the video. So the front and the sides are on and looking good. They're quite nice, a little bit subtle, but one thing that's not so subtle is what's going on the back end of the car because this, I think, is where it really lets the car down. It's just, like I've said already, I don't want to keep going on about it, but it is bland, isn't it? So we have some bits to really spice this up. But to install those, we need to remove the standard rear diffuser on the car. And this is actually really easy to do on the Golf R, much easier than what I'd actually expected. Now, if memory serves me right, it was a T15 in the bottom of the rear diffuser, which goes into a clip. And once that's out, you can pop the rest of the rear clip out just by pulling on it. And then just three more of the same fastenings further along the diffuser. And once all four of those are out, it's then just a good pull from one side which should release the clips and then you can slowly pull the diffuser away from the bumper. Well, I can't get over how easy that actually was. That was a Donald. Even if it was a little bit messy, just because there's a lot of mud down there. While the diffuser was off, this seemed to make a great opportunity for me to give that area a good clean up before I put the new one on. Now, I didn't actually notice this, but the old one is actually damaged. We've got a hole and a scratch here and quite a deep gouge here as well. So it's quite good that we've got a replacement and even better when that replacement's an upgrade. So to match in with the side skirts and the splitter, we've got this juicy carbon fiber one. And these vents are much thicker and much bigger and it should just look much more aggressive. Tie them with the rest of the kit and make this look a whole lot meaner. Right, I've just plonked a bit of tape on there to try and protect the edge of the bumper to make sure I don't scratch it. Well, I thought I was going to have to take the bumper off to get the old diffuser off, but it really is kind of good design from VW that you haven't got to do that. It's almost like they expected you to do bits like this to a car like this, which does make sense really. So, we've got to clip this new one in. So after lining this up and getting it in place, we can give it one final push to secure it into the bumper. And you can see how much more aggressive that is straight away. So now that's clipped in, we can get the tape off and pop in the fastenings so it's secured properly to the car. Now the only difference is for actually fitting the diffuser up is that in the center, instead of using the factory bolts, you replace them with 
tech screws. And so although with every step the Golf is looking better and better, the back end is still looking a bit bare and it definitely needs something up top. Now there's a few options in what we can go for here. There's loads of aftermarket stuff and there's a factory options as well, like the Club Sport spoiler. The problem with the Club Sport one from VW is it's about a thousand pound, I think, although it is gonna be the best fitting replacement. It then also needs painting, because otherwise it looks a bit out of place because there's too much black going on. But there is a much cheaper alternative, and I think it should be just as good, in my opinion, and that is the Auto ID Club Sport style spoiler. So, what that does essentially is stick over the top of what you've got existing on the car, like, that so you still have the blue section like you'd have color coded on the club sport but it's a fraction of the cost less than 10 percent of the cost in fact so in order to fit this what we're going to do is prepare the surface of the spoiler to be stuck to as best as possible so they provide you with a bunch of these adhesion primer wipes so that is going to be my first step so we'll just go over the areas where the new spoiler sticks to so one bit on this side like that Grab another one, use that in the middle, and grab one more for this side, like that. Now, because the last thing we want is this spoiler to fall off, even though it does come provided with some small sticky pads, I'm gonna double up and stick it down also with some Tiger Seal as well as those, and that way we know it's not gonna go anywhere, because the last thing we want for ourselves and for anyone else on the road is for this to come off when we're driving down the motorway. So I removed the backing off the double sided tape and then put a couple of dots of Tiger Seal on. So now it's time to fasten on the spoiler. So I put three generous blobs on each corner and also a tiny bit in the middle as well of Tiger Seal. And now it's just time to get this in place. I kind of wish I had a second person here for this because I feel like you've sort of only got one chance, but let's see what happens. Now you do want to leave a little bit of a gap here just so the spoiler doesn't catch inside the boot itself. That's looking good. This side's fine, probably go a bit tight to this side to be fair. Looking good, looking good, looking good! I like it. Now bang for buck on this kit, I don't think it could get much better. It turns it from being a completely standard little bit boring car to giving it that little edge and just looking like a slightly more beefed up version, I think is the way to put it. But it definitely looks good and sometimes, well obviously we've seen in the past on the i30N and stuff like that, a lot of these aftermarket kits can be a little bit questionable in the way that they fit but all of this stuff is like pretty much OEM quality, even down to the spoiler itself. It fits near on perfect, so thanks to Auto ID for sending those bits out to us. But we've still got a little bit more to do. The next of which being a very simple little interior modification coming from the guys at RPM Performance. This little footrest cover, it's a little detail in the interior which ties in perfectly with the shapes in the pedals, so a nice subtle little one. Now I realise not all of you will love every single modification I ever do to a car, but that's because it's all a very personal thing and it's all down to what that individual person likes. So that's what modifying a car is about. It's about making it your own rather than just having something which came like it from the factory. And that's exactly the reason why I love modifying cars. I like taking something which was all right, but making it unique to me. So we're making some progress with the aesthetic of the Golf and it's looking a lot better, but we do have some more bits to do. Now, before we do that, the Eagle Eye viewers of you will notice from earlier in the video on the driver's side when I had it in the air that there is definitely still a coolant leak underneath, which is strange because when I've driven it, it's not leaked coolant until the next day when it's been parked, I've noticed a puddle underneath. So we really need to find the source of that leak. And by the way, how cool are the new quick jacks I've been sent out? These seem like a great mobile alternative to a scissor lift when you haven't got space like I have to put a scissor lift in because of the way you've got to manoeuvre cars. These can come in and out and they can be moved around with no problems at all and get the car you know, nice and high in the air. But as we can see here is my coolant leak and well, it's going at a good rate to be fair. So to inspect this further, my first job is getting off the under tray. Now what I'm going to do to help me find the leak is repressurize the system with the car off obviously and get this nice and pumped up so we can really kind of pinpoint that problem area. 
But as you can see now, the leak's really coming out, but it's dripping mainly off this intercooler pipe, so that means it's gotta be coming from above there. So I think I've found the source of the problem. Just down there, we've got a connector to the radiator, uh, and that is spraying out under pressure, so but it definitely doesn't like it's that. And you'll also notice a very much bodge pipe here. We noticed this one had a split in it, ordered a new one, but I wanted to try and drive it, so we would just kind of put an aluminium piece as a join to fix that pipe temporarily while we're waiting for the new one, so we're gonna replace that at the same time. So all we've got to do is remove the two damaged bits of pipe in it and replace them for brand new genuine ones. So off comes one and then we can pop in the one that goes to the second cooler on the driver's side, get that in place and then we've just got to get the hose clamps themselves on so the pipes are fastened. Now these can be really difficult so it's been really helpful to have this kind of cable clamp tool which you can feed down into those tricky positions and get those clamps positioned correctly. Then onto the next pipe, which getting off, I did blind myself by getting coolant in my eye before actually removing it and giving myself a shower. I got it out, that was an absolute nightmare. This connector up here is just impossible to get to. I had to reach in there with like the longest screwdriver I had and just, just managed to tip that open, but got there in the end. And you can see now why it's leaking. So just here, you can see there's some damage which looks like it's been caused by the auxiliary pulley. And I think the reason why that's happened, because the mounting points in the AirTech intercooler are a lot bigger than the standard radiator and it gives it a little bit of play. Now, what that allowed it to do is pop out at the top meaning that it's dropped back by maybe half an inch, maybe an inch, and then it's started rubbing on the auxiliary belt, which has caused it to wear through there, and then start leaking. So what I've had to do is put some little bits of rubber in the mounts for the radiator and a fastening screw in the top, just to keep it all nice and tight and save it from doing that again. Right, so now new pipe has just got here. You can see how it's supposed to look, definitely without a big gouge in it. So we can get that on the car, get some coolant back in it. I've secured the radiator to the intercooler better now, so fingers crossed this one doesn't wear again, and we should now permanently hold coolant. So we can now refill the system with coolant using the vacuum filler again, which is gonna make sure that we don't have any air locks. And now onto the final piece of the Auto ID kit, a nice simple one, new mirror caps. The silver really didn't tie in once we had all this other carbon stuff on there, so fitting these gorgeous carbon ones made the world of difference. Well, there's still a dribble of coolant underneath, but that might have been from me spilling it. I'm not 100% sure. But what I do know is that I still haven't really properly driven this car, and that's what we need to go and do right now. So here we go. First proper drive in the Mark 8. I know I have driven it about a mile from my house to where we painted the car and back, but that is it. So you guys are coming with me, and it's gonna be warts and all. First impressions are it's definitely a comfy car. Steering's quite fast, which is good, I like that. But literally the only noise I can hear is the R600 intake we're fitting. I've, I can hear <laughs> well, nothing from the exhaust. Now I don't know if it's because my expectations of what a performance car are is a little bit different maybe to what the person that might buy a Mark 8 Golf R would be, but it's, it's not that it's not fast, it just kind of lacks the drama that I'd expect from like a performance car, does that make sense? I don't know what I was expecting, I just, I don't know, I've never gotten a performance car and felt like it's not a performance car before, does that, that's the only way I can describe it. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never... This is definitely the first time where one of the builds that we've done on the channel, I don't love it out the back. Not that the interior is not lovely, it's not that the outside doesn't look nice, it just hasn't got the drama and the the sense of occasion that you get with you know any other performance car. I don't know if it's just the sound or if it's the way it just kind of almost does it too well, 
but it definitely needs a bit more excitement in here. Now the Golf R is known for having a little party trick which might spice things up a little bit. So it's the launch control. That's what they're all known for. They're known for being rapid off the line. So maybe I should give that a try before giving my final verdict. Right, I've got to turn off the ESC, is it? Which on this seems to take forever. You wouldn't want to be doing this at a set of lights because you're going to lose your race. ESC off, confirm, there we go. Right, let's give it a go. So we want drive, sport, plant it. Okay. It ain't slow. <laughs> it, it lives up to the typical Golf R thing. It's definitely fast off the line. It is a little bit exciting. It's not, it's not all bad. Okay, maybe I was being a little bit harsh on the Mark 8R, but it definitely is lacking that little bit of drama and excitement in your kind of normal driving that you get from a lot of other performance cars. But that's not to say that I don't like it. I just think it needs more work to put it to my taste. But now I've got this new carbon splitter on, the carbon wing mirrors, the side skirts, the Club Sport style spoiler, and also that carbon diffuser. I really, really like the way this car is looking. But there is also some bits on the looks that I still want to improve. And also we have plenty more work to try and make this car what I expected it to be from the start but to see that you're gonna have to wait until the next video so if you enjoyed this one don't forget to like it don't forget to smash on that subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll catch you next time